I'm Marco Baroni from the University of Trento. I'm very glad to be here. Thanks a lot for inviting me. These days also I had a chance to meet many people in uh, uh, Ido Dagan's group uh, uh, and uh, Yoav and other people here at Barilan and I really had uh, a lot of interesting discussions and I also really, I really loved uh, uh, the city and the atmosphere here. So I'm, I'm very, very glad to have this occasion. I'm also glad that finally the slides are shown on the screen. It's kind of funny that we are here talking about like artificial intelligence and intelligent text processing, but uh, we haven't solved yet the problem of connecting computers to projectors very well. And uh, yeah, so I'll start with this uh, introduction to distributional semantics. I will talk for about half hour and then uh, you have, we'll take over. Uh, I must acknowledge uh, Georgiana Dino because uh, several of the slides that uh, I am presenting uh, are actually uh, prepared by uh, Georgiana, who is my colleague in Trento, and also the ERC grant uh, uh, composes uh, that is allowing me to do uh, research uh, on distributional semantics. So uh, the uh, general problem, or one of the largest problems that we have when we want to do semantic analysis of uh, uh, text, uh, and one that maybe like the traditional AI uh, approach of the 70s had uh, severely underestimated, is the vastness of word meaning. So there are like these estimates that say a kid by the end of high school uh, will uh, know in the order of 60,000 words. Uh, an educated adult probably in the order of like hundreds of thousands of words. And so if you want computers to uh, engage in meaningful conversations with us, uh, uh, computers also need to know uh, the meanings of many, many words. Uh, and so probably uh, a manual approach uh, in which we uh, enter a lexicon uh, of uh, uh, word uh, meanings in the computer is not really feasible. And we may want to look at ways to just uh, uh, learn meaning meaning from text in uh, shallow ways, shallow ways. And uh, uh, the uh, main approach that uh, is, uh, uh, has been really popular in different flavors in computational linguistics and NLP for more than uh, uh, 20 or 30 years now uh, is based on uh, the uh, distributional approach of classic uh, structuralism in linguistics, uh, and in particular on the idea that actually uh, there is a, a lot of uh, information about language and even about uh, meaning encoded encoded uh, in the uh, distribution of words in text. So the basic idea that can be formulated in many ways is that the meaning of a word is, or at least it can be learned, from the set of context in which the word occurs in text. And uh, uh, we may like this just because uh, uh, as a as computational linguists, it's easy for us to gather large text corpora, but actually that's probably also part uh, of how we, as human beings, uh, uh, learn the meaning of words. So there are actually serious experiments about this, but uh, my favorite little mental experiment is that if now uh, I tell you uh, we found a little hairy wampy mook sleeping behind the tree, you probably never heard of a wampy mook before, uh, unless you've been to a talk of mine. But still, I think you, just from this sentence, you know a lot of things about a wampy mook. So what is a wampy mook? What kind of animal? Hairy. Uh, well, that's <laughs> you're as bad as a computer, so. <laughs> You typically get also to know that, for example, you would probably not run away from a wampy mook, right? It's probably some kind of little, cute uh, mammal. And so we probably do this kind of distributional learning all the time as humans, and computers can probably do uh, something similar. Uh, in uh, uh, practice, uh, at least the traditional approach to uh, try to encode meaning by distributional uh, methods uh, in a computational uh, representation, uh, this is what I call here the concurrence matrix uh, approach. Uh, Yoav will present later an approach, uh, um, a recently popular approach based on uh, neural network model, is uh, uh, something like this. We gather a large corpus of text, uh, we represent words uh, uh, by vectors, 
measures that keep track of the co-occurrence counts of uh, uh, the words with various elements in the corpus. We may uh, reweight uh, the um, counts in the resulting co-occurrence matrix, for example, trying to give more weight to uh, more informative co-occurrences. Since the matrix might be uh, very, very big, maybe we have like hundreds of thousands of contexts, we might want to uh, reduce this dimensionality in some way. But the important thing is that because uh, uh, each uh, uh, row or column, depending on how you uh, encode your matrix, uh, uh, each row or column in the matrix uh, uh, will represent a word, but it is also, from a mathematical point of view, uh, a vector, so mm -hmm. a point in some kind of space, uh, we can then uh, use uh, uh, straightforward geometric methods to find uh, which words are more similar in meaning. The idea being that if it is uh, uh, vectors uh, uh, represent uh, uh, context in which words occur and similar words occur in similar context, then uh, these vectors uh, uh, should be uh, nearer for words that have uh, similar context and consequently also similar meaning. Let me tell you a bit more about the details of these algorithms. So uh, the first thing I need is a corpus. I will probably have a number of uh, target words that can be very large. Nowadays, it may be like 100, 200,000 words that I want to construct this meaning representation for. So I'm going to traverse my corpus as for the word moon over here. And I'm going to count how many times the word moon occurs with various contexts. Uh, of course, uh, uh, a pretty big issue is what counts as a, a context. Uh, and here there are like various options. So for example, a classic one would be that uh, context uh, uh, mean uh, uh, documents. So I want to count uh, how many times a word, how many times a word occurs in each of the documents in my collection or uh, a classic approach uh, is also to take a fixed window around the world, maybe two words to the left and two words to the right. If my corpus has been parsed, I can try to get more informative context by looking, for example, also at words that are um, connected by a dependency path. So maybe I know, like in the last example here, uh, not only that uh, stars has as one of its context uh, C, but that the connection between stars and C is the connection of a verb with its object, which should be more uh, informative. And also, uh, I may uh, change uh, uh, the way uh, in which, uh, so I may change the con what I consider as a context, uh, and I also may uh, consider what is uh, the uh, exact uh, uh, definition of co-occurrence, what it means to co-occur uh, with a word, for example. It may mean to occur in a window of a certain size. Uh, I may even want to give uh, different weights so that uh, if uh, the word stars occur like uh, adjacent to the word bright, I may want to give more weight to the occurrence with bright than to the occurrence with intensely because uh, intensely occurs a bit uh, on the way. Uh, and of course, there is like a lot of work on all these parameters that change. Uh, and it seems like the solution, I mean, the, the, there is not really a solution such that we can say this particular way of collecting context is the best one. What happens typically is that uh, uh, different kind of context, different kind of co-occurrence uh, are going to give you uh, different kinds of uh, information that might be useful for different applications. So for example, here, uh, I have a pretty vanilla kind of uh, distributional semantic model where the only thing that I changed was whether I was going to count as context words only in a limited window around my target terms or words in a larger window. And these are like the nearest neighbors, so the words that according to my model are like closest to the word dog. You see that in the nearest window, I get uh, uh, neighbors that are uh, uh, in a kind of conceptual sense close to dog. So basically, other, uh, other mammals uh, that we interact with, like cat and horse and a fox. Uh, uh, whereas if I have like a larger window, I tend to have more of a kind of like, uh, uh, maybe we can call it like a frame-based uh, relatedness. So I have uh, uh, words like uh, uh, kennel or to bark uh, that are not conceptually similar to dog. Uh, a dog and the event of barking are very different, but of course they are very related. And so depending on what you do, you might want to change the parameters and you're going to get different results. Uh, once I have collected these uh, um, 
concurrence counts, I can organize them into a matrix, for example, uh, by convention. I don't know, I wonder, Yoav maybe is putting words in the columns in his slides, okay. Uh, by convention, for example, you may want to have the uh, rows of your matrix representing the words that you want to represent the meaning of and the columns uh, representing your, uh, your context. As I uh, said at the beginning, uh, maybe we don't want just to have these uh, row counts, uh, but uh, we want to reweight them in some way. And there is like a huge literature on uh, various ways in which we can assign, uh, um, we can reweight context. But the basic uh, intuition is really that, uh, for example, when a context is very frequent, it is probably uh, less. Uh, uh, informative than a context that it is uh, uh, that is rarer so for example occurring uh, let's say the word dog is uh, uh, certainly going to occur more frequently near the word they than near the word bark but we have an intuition that bark is more informative and so for example the positive pointwise mutual information is one of many statistical measures that uh, reweight the concurrence say of uh, uh, dog with uh, uh, bark uh, by the uh, independent frequencies or probabilities of the target word and of the target context. And so if a target context is very frequent, we are going to down weight uh, the corresponding cell. So for example, uh, in the specific corpus that we run this experiment on, <coughs> which I think was the British National Corpus, although I'm not sure. Um, uh, we have that stars occurs with uh, bright uh, uh, about 400 times, and it occurs with in more than 10,000 times. But uh, uh, when we apply a positive point, point, point wise mutual information weight into these counts, uh, we get that intuition that actually we should uh, uh, value the context bright more than the context in, because in is not a very choosy kind of uh, context. And as I say, there are like many different ways in which you can do this kind of uh, uh, reweighting. Another thing that people often do is uh, uh, dimensionality reduction. So let's say that uh, I have a large corpus and maybe uh, I'm collecting occurrences with words. Then maybe I'm considering occurrences with uh, uh, 300,000 words. That means that I'm going to have a really, really huge uh, matrix. And there are uh, uh, practical reasons to reduce the dimensionality. So if later I want to do something with this uh, uh, matrix, besides just computing similarities, I may want to, uh, for example, if I want to use, which is an increasingly uh, popular application for these models, if I want to use uh, these vectors as features for some machine learning algorithm, maybe I don't want to have 300,000 features, and so I want to reduce the dimensionality for that reason. But also there are uh, techniques uh, uh, to reduce the dimensionality, so to try to uh, capture the same information in a, a smaller matrix, in a matrix that has a, a less uh, uh, cells. Uh, there are like methods that are uh, shown or at least are claimed to also provide a beneficial smoothing. So for example, the classic example is that uh, uh, in the full matrix, uh, maybe you have uh, uh, co-curring with the word automobile and co-curring with the word car, counting as two completely different features. But if you do your dimensionality reduction uh, smartly, maybe uh, you are going to get a single feature in the reduced uh, uh, matrix, uh, which represents a more abstract notion of occurring with vehicles or something like that. And there are many, many uh, techniques to do, um, to do this kind of uh, uh, dimensionality uh, reduction. The uh, most traditional one, and I think probably still the most popular one, is the singular value decomposition. Uh, where uh, without uh, uh, going into the technical details, but it is important because uh, Yoav later will show some uh, connection between uh, the uh, singular value decomposition, or SVD, and some popular neural networks model. The idea of SVD is that we have our concurrence matrix, which is a matrix of uh, uh, words and context. And basically, we try to factorize it in a smaller dimensionality uh, word and context uh, uh, matrices. And then we directly use that uh, thinner word uh, uh, matrix over there as our uh, representation 
of semantic information. I think I can easily skip. Uh, finally, whether I have done weighting, whether I have done dimensionality reduction or not, the important point, as I said, is that uh, uh, our uh, um, vectors are uh, uh, representations of meaning from the point of view of our intentions, but from a mathematical point of view, they are just vectors. So, for example, we can see them as a uh, directed segments from an origin in a, a Cartesian plane to a point where the coordinates correspond to the values of the vector, which means that we can use very standard uh, geometry to measure uh, similarity in meaning. So for example, by far the most uh, uh, used uh, measure is uh, uh, to take the uh, width of the angle that two vectors form uh, as a uh, uh, as our score of how similar the corresponding words will be uh, in uh, meaning. And in particular, uh, uh, rather than using directly the angle width, uh, we use the cosine, which is a monotonic uh, function of, uh, uh, of angle width. And, that's, and it has the convenient property of ranging uh, uh, from uh, uh, 1 for vectors that point exactly in the same direction to 0 for vectors that are uh, at 90 degrees, uh, and if you have uh, negative values, you could, in principle, even have uh, uh, a minus one for uh, vectors that are parallel but pointing in opposite uh, in opposite direction. Again, there are many other uh, similarity uh, measures. Uh, they are all basically based on similar intuition. So, for example, for the cosine, I gave you the geometric intuition. Another way of looking at it is as some kind of correlation coefficient. It is really a non-normalized uh, correlation coefficient, where the idea is that uh, if you look there at the second formula for the cosine, uh, xi and yi will be the corresponding dimensions of the two vectors. And in general, if these are uh, uh, large values uh, uh, together, so when like uh, word one and word two tend to have large values in the same dimensions, that product will get very high, whereas if uh, when one is large, the other one is small, uh, they will tend to cancel out. And so you see why something like the cosine is going to uh, measure how similar uh, the distribution of two vectors are. But there are like many other uh, measures that you could consider. Uh, there is a, uh, a lot of uh, uh, work, of course, on uh, evaluating these models. But just to give you some concrete uh, qualitative uh, example, uh, these are like examples of words that uh, uh, this is a rather like standard uh, distributional semantic model that I constructed by uh, taking the British National Corpus, which is made of about 100 million words of English. I collected, uh, um, I counted as context the top 20,000 words uh, and counted them, I think, when they occurred on a window of five words to the left and to the right. Then I applied the singular value decomposition to the uh, resulting uh, uh, matrix. And here I just got like some words, like for example, rhino, and look at what, were, what will be the vectors that are nearest to the uh, vector of rhino in terms of cosine. And you think that you get very reasonable things. So for example, for rhino, the synonym rhinoceros is the second nearest neighbor. Uh, as, and you have like, you know, other creatures like whale and elephant, you know, large mammals that it makes sense that they are close to uh, rhino. You always get like also a bit of like funny things. So for rhino, the closest word is a woodpecker, which I conjecture is probably because uh, the rhino have like this very prominent uh, horns and the woodpecker has a very prominent uh, uh, beak. Uh, you also have other interesting effects. So rhino is near ivory, which kind of makes sense because the horns of, uh, uh, of rhinos are made of ivory. But then you also have a satin as one of the nearest uh, uh, neighbors of uh, rhino. And probably what you have there is some kind of like triangle inequality effect such that like ivory and satin are near in space uh, because they are both uh, uh, kind of luxury. Uh, materials. And so if rhino is close to ivory, then ivory is, uh, and ivory is uh, close to satin. As a consequence, also rhino will be near satin. And this is maybe um, 
the biggest problem of distributional semantic models, that they are very good at telling us that words are similar, but they are not very good at telling us how they are similar. So we want to distinguish the way in which rhino is similar to rhinoceros to the way in which it is similar to ivory, for example. A nice property of uh, uh, distributional semantic models is that they work very well not only for nouns or concrete nouns, but also for abstract nouns, adjectives, and verbs. So for example, for a fall as a noun, you see that we get very reasonably, reasonably as nearest neighbors, other values uh, on uh, uh, the same uh, uh, scale. So you have that fall is very similar to rise, uh, increase, uh, drop, uh, decline, hike, uh, and so on and so forth. Good as an adjective is uh, close to bad, excellent, superb, and so on and so forth. Or for a verb like singing, we get like other verbs connected to uh, either making vocal uh, sounds like whistling or some kind of music performance like uh, uh, dancing. Um, in concrete, there have been like a number of benchmarks that by now have become kind of like a standard to evaluate these kind of models quantitatively. So one classic uh, uh, way to evaluate them uh, is to uh, get a bunch of human subjects and ask them to rate the similarity of a number of words. So they may tell you that uh, chapel and church are kind of highly related concepts, uh, whereas a bikini and pizza have a very little in common. Uh, we get these scores from, for example, an average of uh, uh, subjects. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, then we have like our models producing the cosines for the corresponding pairs of vectors. And we correlate these with the human scores. Uh, and by now, we are uh, at a, a very high uh, level. So for something like the main data set, which has about uh, uh, 3,000 of these pairs, uh, we get that our models get correlations by now that are like often over uh, 0 0.7. And the human uh, uh, annotator agreement is at uh, 0 0.8. And I think there are models of, of the neural kind that are also at 0 0.8. So basically, uh, our models are as good as another subject at guessing similarity. And there are other ways in which the models have been evaluated. For example, another interesting one is to have data sets where you have concepts organized by category. So you may have like a, a, a set of vehicles, such as helicopters, cars, and so on and so forth. You may have a set of animals, such as dog and cat, and so forth. And you use a, a, the vectors of your model to perform a clustering. And you see whether the clustering performed by the model is matching uh, our uh, annotations about categories. So whether the model, say, was able to, um, to group, say, cars with cars, uh, and animals with animals, and tools with tools, and so on and so forth. And again, the models by now are at almost like human-like performance on this kind of uh, tasks. Uh, even when you have rarer words there and uh, more complicated settings. Uh, but you can do also uh, things that don't uh, rely directly uh, on like similarity of pairs of words uh, with this model. So for example, a very interesting line of research is the one where the models have been used uh, to try to, to try to get uh, at uh, uh, at the so-called effect of selectional preferences, uh, where, uh, for example, we know that verbs uh, tend to impose uh, uh, strong uh, uh, constraints on the kind of uh, things that can be their objects or subjects, and so on and so forth, uh, such that, for example, if I have like uh, the verb to eat, uh, I know that pizza is very likely as an object of to, pit of, of to, of to eat, uh, but, for example, pizza is not very likely as a subject. Uh, to it. And uh, uh, something that people like Katrin Erk and colleagues have been experimenting is to model this kind of selectional preferences as follows. Let's say that I have, for example, from a parsed corpus, uh, a list uh, of uh, nouns that I know that they often are objects of a certain verb. Then if I have distributional representations of these nouns, I can average 
these representations and get a vector which will represent somehow the prototype object of the verb to eat or of the verb to kill and so on and so forth. So a vector that I constructed by averaging uh, uh, vectors of uh, words that are often the object, the subject or what have you of the verb of interest. And then for any arbitrary other word, for example, for pizza, I can measure the similarity of pizza to the vector for the prototypical object, for example, of the verb to eat. And probably I will find that, yes, indeed, uh, pizza is something that you can eat. And here are just like some uh, uh, Concrete examples of this, so for example, for the verb to kill, we are implemented the method of uh, Erk and colleagues. And uh, uh, what we find is that, for example, our model, using the method that I said, that I described, think that it's very likely that you can kill a kangaroo. And this is despite the fact that in our source corpus, the corpus we trained our model on, there were no uh, instances of kangaroos being killed, and vice versa. Uh, the model finds that it's not very likely that you're going to kill the conversation, despite the fact that uh, uh, as a metaphorical usage, you get killing the conversation quite often in the corpus. So you can do like more sophisticated things with, uh, uh, with the models. Uh, and uh, uh, we uh, have like no time here to really get detailed into an application, but like although it I think these models, it's fair to say, uh, are more like promising than really have been like proven their worth in end uh, uh, applications, mainly because of that problem that I uh, mentioned that it's hard to kind of distinguish between different kinds of similarities. Uh, Still, there are like uh, some cases in which uh, uh, it is possible to show that distributional semantic models can uh, um, can significantly improve on some complex tasks, like, for example, machine translation, where one idea that has been used in uh, uh, different ways uh, uh, by different people is that suppose that you train uh, a, a distributional semantic model in two languages, then you expect that more or less the similarity structure uh, of the two languages is going to be kind of uh, uh, similar. So let's say that, for example, I have training examples that tell me that the word cow in English corresponds to the word vaca in Spanish, the word dog corresponds to the word uh, perro, and so on and so forth. And let's say that now I have the word pig, and I have no idea of how to translate pig uh, into Spanish. If I look at the similarity of the two spaces, uh, I could see, hey, look, uh, uh, pig is between cow and dog, and uh, uh, it is a uh, uh, Spanish word, cerdo, <coughs> is between vaca and perro. So it is likely that maybe they are translations of each other. And indeed, uh, uh, there has been like research on these, including a recent paper, which shows that actually you can get significant improvements uh, on, dif on difficult uh, uh, language pairs like English and Urdu or English and Arabic by using this kind of uh, uh, distributional information. Uh, I think I can uh, skip this because I would like, uh, I have some references, but I think probably the slides are going to go online at a certain point. And so rather than uh, going through them now, I'll ask Ido to post them somewhere. Let me just like, how much, uh, how are we doing with time? Okay. 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 So it looks, it turns out it was a problem with the link. So I have just like about one minute now, but just to show you, um, to get an idea, like a non-precurated idea, does anybody want to suggest an English word? It has to be like a noun, a verb, or an adjective, because that happens to be what this model is trained for, that you want to try. Projector. Projector. So this is a noun, and this is for English. OK, projector, you get video, footage, camera, TV, screen, hair dryer, television, audio, recorder. I'd say it's pretty reasonable. But projector is kind of like a concrete noun, which is maybe the easiest for these models. Somebody wants to try something? Go for love. Hmm? Love?
Love, joy, passion, longing, kindness, affection. It's pretty good, no? I mean, I find that, I mean, I, I feel like with this model, with, with this. It seems you have also some political correctness factor. <laughs> so, and uh, political correctness stuff is interesting. So, of course, one issue that actually I skipped completely, but it's kind of important, is like, what is your source corpus? So, uh, here, for example, we have uh, the British National Corpus, which is uh, more or less a balanced corpus with different kind of text in it. But for Italian, I have uh, a, a newspaper corpus. Let's see what happens there with Amore. So you do get some interesting difference. So for example, like for Amore, the closest thing in uh, Italian, which is funny because Italians are not particularly patriotic, but it turns out it's like your homeland love. Uh, and uh, yeah, for the rest, you have incest, you have extra, extra, extra marital, you have sex. Uh, so it's a bit more interesting, yeah. OK, so maybe it's time for uh, you have to take over. So um, I'm Yoav Goldberg. I'm a faculty here at uh, bar -Ilan, and I'll present the uh, second half uh, of this uh, uh, tutorial. And while um, Markman focused on uh, how these um, semantic similarities work on kind of the traditional uh, setup, where you have uh, vectors and you count uh, words uh, and their context and you kind of see what's going on, uh, there has been this uh, a new work lately uh, of uh, distributed semantics, so like uh, neural network-based models. Um, and they're kind of like this uh, new promising uh, approach that kind of started like uh, two years ago or so in the NLP community or in the uh, neural net community. Uh, and what's happened uh, there is like you have you basically feed your text into this uh, neural network, and you get back magical vectors, which are kind of word embeddings, they are called. Uh, so each word is um, represented as this um, dense vector. Uh, and these vectors somehow capture semantics. And there has been this um, uh, program uh, called word to vec by uh, Tomasz Mikolov and his uh, colleagues <laughs> That kind of, you just kind of feed text, you get back vectors, and they uh, work, which kind of like looks magical. Uh, and over the past year or so, uh, I've been working uh, here um, with um, Omer Levy, mostly, I think he's over there in the crowd, uh, on basically understanding uh, why these things work and how to uh, extend and, and improve them. Uh, and, we'll, and basically, what I'll describe today is first, um, I'll describe what to vec as a black box and how you actually work with these models. Uh, then we'll have a little peek uh, inside this black box and, sh and somehow uh, give you an intuition on how or why it works. Uh, I'll show some relation of how it relates uh, to the uh, things Marco described. Uh, and then I'll give some hints on how you may want to kind of uh, tailor what to vec to your likings uh, with some extension, which we call the what to vec F for features. Uh, so this is going to be kind of a shallow and dense talk on a kind of a very uh, deep and wide topic. So I will not get into the uh, details, but you can ask me of course, later. Uh, so uh, what to vec is this uh, problem, which I think um, many of you have at least heard of, uh, because it kind of uh, made a lot of uh, news, or like, uh, well, not popular news, but like uh, in some circles, uh, it uh, has been quite famous. Uh, and you can download it. Uh, and the promise, and actually what happens, is you take some text, like uh, Wikipedia, and you kind of remove all of the tables and the junk, so you get only kind of sentences. And then you uh, feed it into this uh, word to vec neural method thing. You wait a few hours, or if you have uh, many calls, then you wait like uh, only one or two hours uh, for like, um, uh, large text, like Wikipedia, which is kind of uh, five billion or four billion words. Uh, and then what you uh, get back uh, is this uh, matrix, uh, which um, has many rows, like the, the size of your uh, vocabulary, basically 170K words, so a lot of words. Uh, and each word is a d-dimensional vector, usually like uh, 100, 300, like what you choose. And so like a dog would be like these numbers, uh, 0.12, uh, minus 0.32, whatever. A uh, cat have similar numbers, chair have different numbers, and so on. Um, so we just basically get this uh, matrix W, where uh, each um, row is um, a vector for, for a word. 
Okay, and if you uh, look at kind of nearest neighbors in this space, you get like nice things. So uh, dog is similar to uh, dog, cats, uh, Dutch hound, and so on. Uh, sheep, which is also animal, but like uh, cattle and goats and cows and, and, and chickens, like things you, that you grow and eat, basically. Um, months cluster nicely together. Uh, Jerusalem uh, has a nice uh, feel to it, like uh, similar cities. Uh, Teva is a, a company, so it uh, is uh, grouped with uh, similar companies, uh, and so on. So these things seem to work uh, pretty nice. Uh, now I'll kind of uh, give you some tips of how you actually work with these uh, dense vectors. Um, so similarity, that's what you want to do, like how similar are two worlds. So basically it's the uh, cosine similarity which uh, Marco described uh, earlier. Um, so basically take the dot product and then you uh, divide by the norms. Uh, and if these vectors are uh, normalized to begin with, uh, then uh, similarity is just a dot product which is very easy to do. So basically, my tip here would be to just uh, load your uh, words uh, into uh, memory and then uh, normalize them uh, at once. And then after that, you just like, uh, do, do dot products, which is uh, very convenient. Now, if you want to uh, find the most similar words, so not only a pair, but like give me the most similar words to, to dog, so I want to basically compute the similarity from one word, call it V, uh, to all of the other words, okay? And then after I do that, I kind of uh, pick the, uh, the most similar ones. Uh, so in this framework, basically, it's only a single uh, matrix vector product. So I take my uh, um, word, uh, matrix, um, I multiply the, it uh, by the uh, dog vector, and I get this uh, large vector of uh, similarity where each entry is a similarity to one of the words in the uh, vocabulary. Okay? Uh, and then I basically uh, take this um, vector and I take the uh, k highest uh, values in it, and these are the words that uh, are most similar. And the uh, thing is that this, kind, this thing is kind of uh, very, very fast uh, to do um, with a reasonable library. So for uh, 180k words, uh, which uh, with uh, 300 um, dimensions, it's kind of like uh, 330 milliseconds for this query. Uh, so um, it's pretty fast, and you can kind of uh, compute similarities uh, quite quickly. Uh, and here is some code uh, in NumPy that uh, does that. A lot of the, uh, so it basically kind of uh, retrieves the words and everything, but most of the um, work is done in this um, uh, line over here. Okay, so this is just a dot product, and that's kind of optimized and works well. Um, now, if you want to compute similarity to a group of words, Okay, so I want uh, find me words that are most similar to cat, dog, and cow. Okay, so one way to do this would be to just uh, calculate similarities uh, to each element uh, in the group. Okay, and then sum them, and then you have like uh, a large vector of similarities to all of them, and then you uh, take the uh, highest value indices, uh, which is okay, uh, but not very efficient, okay? So a better option would be to uh, first uh, concatenate uh, or uh, sum the word vectors and then do uh, a single matrix multiply, okay? So, uh, and this is kind of uh, very efficient and very, very easy to do. So you get some kind of uh, uh, composite effect and it's kind of also the same thing mathematically. So it's nice to have. Uh, and you can kind of uh, have a similarity to many, many words like this way. So that's kind of an uh, efficiency tip if you want to uh, work with these uh, models. Okay, so working with these dense vectors um, can be very, very efficient, okay? Uh, and they're basically very convenient to learn into memory. They're easy to store, they're kind of nice and, and dense, uh, and they produce nice results. But now let's try to understand where, where do, do these vectors actually come from, okay? What's, what's the source? So um, I'll describe how word to vec works, uh, and word to vec actually implements uh, different algorithms uh, in the uh, same framework, and, and depending on what uh, parameters you give it, uh, you'll get, uh, it's, it, it'll be a different algorithm. Uh, but basically there are two training methods, uh, negative sampling and hierarchical softmax, uh, and there are uh, two way to uh, Represent context, which is uh, the SIBO and the skip grams, and I will um, focus on negative sampling and uh, and skip grams um, because they are kind of 
more easy to explain maybe, uh, but all of the intuition should carry to the other models uh, as well to, uh, to some extent. But also kind of this pair works very, very well. So just use that and it, you'll be fine. Um, so how does word to vec work? So the way it works is you represent each word uh, as a d-dimensional vector, so that's kind of the blue over there. And then you, uh, you take each context, which is a neighboring word, uh, also as a, a d-dimensional vector. Okay, so each word basically has now two, uh, two different representations, one of them as a word and one of them as a context. So the uh, vector for, say, dog as a context would be different than the, than the vector of dog for a word. Okay. So you have these uh, two matrices, and you initialize them with random weights. So they're kind of random at the beginning. Okay. Um, and then there are these matrices. Now you take text, and you just mo move over it window by window. Okay. So you take one window, say uh, a cow or a heifer close to calving, just some part of Wikipedia text. Uh, and uh, one word would be the, uh, the focus word, and then to the sides you have context. So here W is the Hafer is the uh, context word, uh, and uh, uh, the context are the kind of words around it, the uh, CIs. So you have uh, one row in W and several rows in C. And then you, the, you try to set the numbers in these vectors uh, iteratively. I will not go into the, uh, to the details here, uh, such that um, the sigmoid of the sum, so uh, sigmoid is this function which is kind of monotonic, uh, so kind of, and it's, Part of the algorithm, just like uh, you can ignore it for this thing, and uh, so it's not there for this example. Just kind of ignore that. So you uh, want the values such that uh, the word multiplied by the first context plus the word multiplied by the second one, etc., uh, would be high. So basically, you want to uh, optimize it such that every uh, uh, interaction between a word and a context around it would be uh, as high as possible, uh, basically. Okay, uh, and then this is uh, easy to do if you set all the vectors to say one, so like everything will be high with, with everything, so that's bad. Uh, so we want it to be high for uh, this context, uh, but also uh, low for other contexts. So what we do here is we just basically uh, sample a random world, okay, uh, for the, uh, for the window, so now we have like say comet over there, and then you want uh, pairs of uh, cow and comet, for, say, or uh, comet and close, or uh, comet and calving, to be uh, low. Okay, so you want to uh, maximize the the dot product basically between a word and a good context, and to minimize the uh, product between a word and a bad context. Uh, and you do it iteratively over, over and over again uh, on many, many windows in a very large corpus. And what you get uh, at the end is that you have uh, a very high dot product uh, for good word context pairs. Uh, you get uh, low dot product um, for bad word, word context pairs. And you get uh, okayish uh, dot product uh, for pairs which are neither high nor low, okay, so um, um, that way around. Uh, so basically, uh, cow um, and, wheat and milk will, will be very high, uh, cow and audience will be very, very low, uh, and cow and is will be in the middle because is is kind of goes with everything, right? Um, and then as a result uh, of this, uh, words that share many contexts will get closer together. Okay, in, in the space, uh, and uh, contexts that share uh, many words get called together in that space as well. Uh, so we run it uh, for several iterations, and at the end, what WaterVec does is basically uh, throw away C, so it ignores all of the context, and then and just takes W, okay, uh, which is our uh, word ma our words matrix, and then words uh, that appeared in many different contexts will be uh, similar to each other, and you'll have this uh, very nice. Um, semantic space or semantic model. So that's basically uh, what word to vec does, and it does it very, very efficiently with many threads and, and so on. Okay, but now let's try to look at it from a slightly different angle, okay? So imagine we didn't throw away the, the, the context, okay? So we keep both C and W, and then we just uh, multiply them. So uh, take the multiplication of the word vectors and the, uh, and the context vector, and what you get as a result is a very large matrix, 
which you cannot really store, but it will be there, uh, where each uh, row is a word, each uh, column is a context, and each cell will correspond um, to basically the multiplication of a word of a specific word and context, okay, which is basically some association, me association measure uh, between a word and the context. Okay? Uh, and I guess this thing looks kind of uh, familiar uh, from, uh, from Marco's talk uh, before. Okay? So basically this thing is very, very similar uh, to SVD. Okay, so in SVD, we start with this uh, word context matrix and we define some measure of association, okay, say a uh, positive PMI, which, is, which works very, very well. And then you approximate it with uh, two uh, thin matrices. Okay? And what happens here is that we start with two thin matrices, uh, but basically they actually represent um, some implicit uh, word context matrix in a different space. So now, something to ask would be, okay, so if we were to look at this matrix, what would it be? Or like, what's the association? Um, and uh, with work, uh, with uh, Omer, we showed that actually uh, this matrix that you reconstruct is very, very similar or very, or very much related to the uh, positive PMI thing. So this thing is very, very similar to SVD, but it does it in a slightly different uh, way so there are differences in what it in, in what it optimizes, but the idea of having words and, and context in a matrix uh, is there. Okay, so that's basically uh, what I said, um, and so that's the kind of relation uh, between SVD uh, and word to vec So word to vec is basically a technique to uh, do dimensionality reduction, okay, over some implicit word context matrix just like SVD uh, is doing, uh, and actually with a few tricks uh, which we show in this uh, paper and we're not talk about today, you can get SVD to work just as well uh, as word to vec okay, on many, many things. Um, but uh, word to vec is nice because it works without building this matrix. So you, you don't have to count, you don't have to kind of store words uh, or like uh, store pairs, you just kind of uh, store a vector for each word, which is much more um, reasonable to do in memory or much more efficient. It's also very, very fast to train uh, as opposed to uh, SVD, which is kind of can take some time to do even with uh, um, very optimized systems if you have a, a very large sparse matrix. And um, it can use multiple threads. As, as a result, uh, this thing is very, very easy to uh, scale up to uh, huge data and uh, very, very large word and, and, uh, and context vocabulary. And a lot of the power comes from that. We can just like apply it to very, very large text uh, and get uh, very nice results at the end quite quickly. Okay, so if you were to ask me, uh, should I use um, SVD or like uh, uh, Marcos-based uh, methods or uh, this new word to vec uh, technique, I would say go for word to vec in the beginning. If it works, then, then great. If not, you can investigate further. But these things are very, very easy uh, to, to work with. The only thing which they are not great for is uh, interpretation. So you don't know uh, what each dimension means. Uh, and also you cannot really uh, play with, uh, with different similarities because you have to use cosine. But if that's okay for you, and I guess in industry that should be fine, um, then this thing uh, is very, very easy to, to work with and, uh, and very efficient. And now let me just uh, give you uh, some words of how to kind of go slightly beyond what, uh, what Wotovec uh, gives you and to somewhat uh, extend it uh, a bit to kind of uh, tailor it to your uh, needs to, to some extent. So as we've uh, seen, word to vec is basically factorizing this uh, word context matrix, right? Uh, and um, the content of this matrix affects the, the, um, the similarities that you get back, okay? Uh, and word to vec basically gives you this uh, parameter, which is how large should the, should the window be? And that's important because as we've seen uh, in uh, Marco's talk, uh, larger um, windows will get uh, more uh, general kind of uh, things that are related to what you want to find, uh, and like smaller windows will get uh, more focused uh, maybe similarities. Uh, but maybe we can have like uh, different kinds of, of context, like uh, the pencil relations, also as, as Marco showed, which will give you uh, a different kind of semantic space. Uh, and we have this uh, extension uh, of Autovec that, that, uh, that allows to, to do it. It's 
Levy and Goldberg, right? It's a mistake. Uh, so that, that's actually my work, and not in those. But uh, it's all the same, you know, uh, a typo. Yeah, the same family. Um, yeah. So. Uh, so now I'll kind of uh, describe uh, like uh, this context and how they will uh, affect the, the model. So the idea is that like if you take this like uh, window to each side, you get this uh, bug of word uh, model. So take this sentence says uh, Australian scientist discovers stars with, and you and you look like at uh, two words to to each uh, side, and you see that uh, here the kind of uh, discover uh, is the uh, is the focus word, and we get Australian and scientist and star and wit. Okay, so discover star is nice, uh, scientist and and discovered is nice, Australian. Not really related to discovery. I mean, they do discover stuff. I'm not saying anything about against them, but like, uh, it's not like the most prominent uh, thing for uh, discovery or for Australians. Okay. Now, telescope uh, is actually good for discovery, but it's not in our window because we only choose uh, two, so we kind of so it uh, got left out. Okay. Um, now, if we look, uh, so if we uh, parse the sentence and we look at the kind of dependencies that uh, we get, and I like to do parsing because that's what I mainly do, so I parse things a lot. But uh, if you look at these things, now you get that uh, discover is the kind of uh, subject of scientist. Uh, it, uh, it is applied to, to star as a uh, direct object of it, uh, and you do it with a telescope. Okay, so now you have all of the things that are related uh, to uh, discovery with the relation, and uh, Australian, which is not related, kind of left out. So we kind of have a more focused kind of uh, context. And we can uh, just uh, uh, now, if we feed this as context to what to vec instead uh, of feeding um, our uh, window around the world, Okay. Uh, what we'll uh, get is uh, is something like that. So, a uh, few examples uh, for um, Hogwarts, which is a, a school of magic from uh, Harry Potter. Okay. So, if you have uh, uh, five words uh, to each uh, side, you'll get things like uh, Dumbledore and Hallows and Half Blood and Malfoy and Snape, which are basically uh, things from the Harry Potter universe. Okay. So, like. Uh, Things that are kind of like Harry Potter or like uh, are related to it, uh, while in the uh, dependency-based context you get basically names of schools uh, or uh, good private schools uh, in the uh, US, in the U.S. Uh, slightly down the list you get uh, Degrassi, which is kind of a fictional uh, school. Okay, but yeah. Okay, so <laughs> good to know. <laughs> Um, so basically, uh, you see this kind of very different kind of similarities uh, that emerge, and uh, depending on what you want to to get, uh, you should use like the context that you that is more suitable to you. Okay. Uh, if you look at uh, Turing, which is a famous scientist, which you may have heard of, um, so if you look at the kind of uh, bug of context, you get uh, non-deterministic, non-determinism, computability. Uh, finite states, basically a uh, thing about computability, which is kind of a notion around uh, Turing or his theories. And if you look at uh, dependencies, you get uh, Pauling and Hotelling and Hesting and Lessing and Humming, which are basically uh, scientists that end with ING. Uh, so uh, the ING uh, is a byproduct of the model, so uh, probably some uh, parsing mistakes along the way. Uh, grouped some ING things together, but if you go uh, slightly down the list, you get uh, Polya and other uh, scientists that are not really related uh, to the ING suffix. So you uh, also get um, some, you know, <laughs> bad things here. Uh, but uh, generally, this works uh, very well, and I would at least argue that uh, for my purposes, I would uh, prefer to have uh, this uh, list of scientists next to Turing than just like things that he he did. But again, it depends on the application. Uh, as the last example, uh, dancing uh, will be related to dance and dancers and dancers and singing and tap dancing, uh, while in the dependency uh, thing you get uh, various gerund. Here the ING is important and is correct, actually, uh, in the uh, entertainment domain. OK, so again, uh, depends on what you do. Uh, it says uh, online demo here, and there is one, but I will not show it. Um, so you can uh, go on later. Just uh, look for Omer Levy's website, uh, and then there is a link there to the to the demo. Okay, so basically, what I'm trying to say is that uh, context matters. Okay, and you uh, should choose uh, the right context for your application. So uh, larger windows, more topical, dependency relation, more functional. I think they can actually replace each other. 
Uh, but you can also think of like other things. Maybe you want to kind of uh, fill it only noun adjective relations or uh, only verb subject relations. And kind of depending on what you do, you'll get different kinds of similarities. They may be more focused to like some aspect of similarity. So kind of like uh, play with what, you, what, with what you expect to achieve just by kind of uh, playing with the uh, different context in, uh, in some kind of uh, preprocessing. And also can kind of uh, get um, more imaginative. So you can say, OK, so if you have something like uh, uh, Twitter or you have like many messages coming in a stream or, or Facebook or something like that, you can say that, OK, the context is the time of the, uh, of the, of the current message, and the words are the words. And then you kind of uh, get grouping of words uh, as to when in the day they are usually used. OK, so you get like uh, night words and uh, uh, morning words and things like that. Um, or like you can say, okay, so the context uh, is the user who, uh, who wrote the message uh, and the uh, word is the text, and then you'll get uh, basically different topics of, uh, of conversations, and you can also kind of get uh, different users uh, uh, grouped together based on what they want to talk about. Okay, so there are kind of many uh, applications of these kind of uh, similarities just by kind of uh, tweaking the, the input uh, to your uh, system, and really you can do uh, go crazy with it and kind of uh, invent new things to, uh, to try out. Okay, uh, and for that we have some, some software. So uh, World to vec allows you uh, to basically gives you uh, only um, words in, in, in some context. Uh, we have this uh, extension World to vec f Okay, uh, it's uh, freely available. Basically, uh, we took the code and, and did some modification, and now first you can actually save also the, uh, the context matrix as well as the word, which is maybe nice to have. Uh, but uh, most importantly, it uh, allows you to use arbitrary context uh, the way it works. You just kind of uh, prepare your uh, very large file uh, of uh, word context pairs, so like one pair in each line. And then you, uh, you fill it into that, and it works uh, quite fast and, uh, and gives you a result. So you may want to kind of, you may need to store a very large file of uh, several um, tens uh, or maybe even hundreds of, uh, of, of gigabytes. That, that's kind of cheap to do. And then it will work uh, online uh, with very, very good uh, memory requirements. OK, uh, some other software package which you can use uh, is called uh, HyperWorld. So that's uh, basically um, a Python library of working with either a sparse uh, and dense vectors, so kind of like tricks for doing things quite efficiently, putting uh, similarities or, uh, or analogies. Uh, and then there are kind of uh, scripts for like creating various different uh, contexts uh, for word to vec f or for SVD if you want to use uh, that approach. Uh, and then uh, there are also scripts for uh, doing the kind of uh, things Marco described uh, earlier. Okay, so that's kind of uh, nice to, to have and easy to do. You could actually write everything in here on your own. It will take you like a few weeks and that's uh, nice and maintained and uh, supported and just have a look. Uh, and then uh, from uh, Marco's side, uh, so something Marco did not talk about because he didn't have the uh, time, uh, is basically a way to um, try and combine the meanings uh, of two different uh, or, uh, or more words. Like you have orange and you have juice, but you want to have some meaning for orange juice together, which is uh, different than kind of the, uh, the different parts. Uh, so there is some research on how to do it uh, intelligently, and it doesn't work perfectly, but it, work, but it works uh, quite well. Um, so uh, basically, this package uh, for Marco, you give it a uh, vector presentation of words, and it will derive uh, how to represent, uh, to represent sentences or phrases, OK? Uh, and uh, there are different kind of uh, composition methods uh, implemented there. So uh, check it out, have a look. Um, to summarize what we have uh, seen in this um, dense and short tutorial on a very wide topic. Um, so we started in the first half by talking about distribution semantics. So basically, this means that words in similar context have similar uh, meanings. Okay, and basically you represent each word by the context it appears in, and you can get uh, very useful stuff from that. Uh, but then you have to ask yourself, what is a context? Okay, so what do I choose as my context? And also, how do I weigh them? Like, uh, how much weight do I give to, uh, to, to different contexts? And then we've seen the neural methods, like uh, word to vec uh, which where each word is basically a short vector of numbers. 
But we have seen that the, the same intuitions apply uh, also uh, in this kind of uh, model. But the uh, to one, to one, they scale well, uh, they're nice to work with. Uh, but still, it's very helpful to think about them in terms of like context types and what you want to get out of your model. So basically, design your, um, your context uh, to get what you want. So basically, if you want to um, improve such model, uh, one way would be to look at the machine learning aspect of it, which is, I try to do it also, but uh, you will get much larger mileage if you just uh, change your context, basically, uh, to what you want uh, to do. Okay. Uh, and then we uh, showed some uh, software which will allow you to just uh, go uh, home or to your company and start uh, hacking away on new world representations for uh, stuff that you want to do. So that's our uh, tutorial for uh, today, uh, and thanks for listening. <laughs>